If you would, please turn to Acts 8. I will be reading verses 26 through 39. Out of the King James Version. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship with returning, and sitting in his chariot read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a, sheep, as a sheep to the slaughter, and, a, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh this prophet? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If you believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they rose, and when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And I also give you very good greetings. Good morning this, to see you all. Good to see you this morning. Good morning to all of you. And I hope that uh, everybody is doing well. It has just been very, very wet. And we got a little downpour a little while ago. I know some came in and, and got soaked. But we're glad that you're here and that we hope that uh, it will be commodious uh, for being here today. It is so good to see Jesse. Uh, Jesse has been in the hospital a couple of times and got out of the hospital last week, but feeling well enough to be here today. That's a real blessing, Jesse, and it's just good to see you here. And, of course, as many of us have also noticed and seen, that our good brother Earl Murray is here and with his beautiful fiancée, Lottie. And they will be getting married very soon here in, uh, in March coming up. And we had opportunity to meet yesterday and Vicki, and we all went out for dinner last night and going over things. But it's just a real pleasure uh, to have them here today uh, as well. I also wanted to give a very serious announcement in reference to uh, the situation in Zimbabwe continues to worsen. As I mentioned last week in talking with Brother John Skoltz this past week briefly and how dangerous it has become even for brethren now who are being at times stopped while they're traveling or coming into their homes and if they don't have receipts that they can prove for food or things that they have, many times things are being confiscated. The police have become all the more corrupt. The government has become all the more corrupt. And John is requesting prayer on their behalf. It is just a very, very dire, difficult situation. We need, we talked about this at the men's devotional study yesterday and had prayer to that effect. And I would just like to ask whoever has the closing prayer this morning that you would include those Zimbabwe brethren uh, in our prayer together. I think that that would be a good thing for us to do. I have been going back and forth alternating to a certain degree on a couple of series that we're doing on Sunday mornings, dealing with Imagine Leadership, a series on leadership. have a whole lot more to say about that. A few weeks ago, I gave a lesson in reference to baptism and what baptism is all about. 
And I want to continue this as being kind of a second installment, if you will, and appreciate the reading that Brother Tim Rodriguez did for us a couple of moments ago, is we think about baptism the Ethiopian way, which becomes the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts. Be reminded that it is within the book of Acts that we find these multiple cases of conversion of people that were brought to Christ through the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ. And we see that there is a consistency, that there is a, a commonality that takes place as people were converted to Christ, what they were exposed to, what they did, what they were required to do. Now what we have seen within Acts chapter 8, that is within the text, Philip is afforded, that's the preacher, he has afforded another opportunity to preach the gospel of Christ, and now in the middle of the Gaza desert. Remember, earlier in Acts 8, he had just left Samaria where he preached the gospel to that city and experienced, by the way, great success. Philip's preaching was obviously instructive. His preaching in Samaria, what we're going to see in his preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch. But his preaching was instructive, as in the case of the Samaritans, now also to this Ethiopian man. In Samaria, it says, you would notice earlier on in chapter 8 and verses 12 and 13, that Philip preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say that both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and so forth. There was success, and there were many men and women that were baptized as a result of Philip's preaching the gospel to them. So now as we go on into Acts chapter 8, and we see this account again in the Gaza desert, to the Ethiopian, the text simply says, if you would notice in verse 35 again of Acts 8, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the same scripture, and as we're going to see in a moment, that he's referring to Isaiah 53, the Old Testament prophecy. But Philip, beginning at that same scripture, does what preached Jesus to him. The result was the same. People were baptized. As there were many Samaritans baptized earlier in, in Samaria of Acts 8, now we see the Ethiopian eunuch is baptized as well. But the Ethiopian's response to Philip's teaching is also instructive. You see, we often talk about well, what was preached and what was instructed, and that's important, and we're going to highlight that as well. But to me, what is fascinating is not just is the preaching instructive, but because of what God has left for us in his word, that we see that the response of people like the Ethiopian eunuch, that too is instructive. Are we to look at these examples of these examples or cases of conversion in the book of Acts, and when we see the positive response of those people responding to the gospel, is that teaching us important, valuable lessons today as well? Is it? Of course it is. And that's what I want us to think about when we talk about baptism, the Ethiopian way, because here he is in the middle of the Gaza Desert, taking a break, reading from the scroll of Isaiah, Philip is instructed by the Spirit to go join, to talk to him about that. Do you understand what you're reading? And we go through this whole scenario. And then we see of what it results in, in the conversion of this man. And so the Ethiopians' actions demonstrate biblical precedence for our learning. In fact, the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch to Christianity teaches us many, I believe, valuable and important lessons about the biblical doctrine of baptism. And that's what we're interested in. We're not interested in tradition. We're not interested in opinions. We're interested in the biblical New Testament doctrine of baptism. And I want us to observe, when it comes to baptism, I want us to observe five, I believe, five salient facts about baptism as we explore this account in Acts chapter 8. We'll have a few cross-references here and there, but I want you to pay close attention to what we see in this text in Acts chapter 8. The very first thing that we see that becomes quite obvious is that is the essential nature of baptism. That is so much seen that baptism in this case is essential, and this is parallel to so many other examples and statements of fact that are made about it. Now think about this. I want to ask you as to the kind of character of the individual that this Ethiopian eunuch happened to be. 
And the very thing, thing that really stands out to me is do we see in this Ethiopian eunuch a man of some moral integrity? I mean, that becomes very obvious or apparent that he was a man of moral integrity, and that is deduced from the position to which even the queen had appointed him. What was his job? What was his role? He was the treasurer to Queen Candace of the Ethiopians. Even Albert Barnes had noticed in his history and in his commentary on Acts, he says the treasurer was an officer of high trust and responsibility. Imagine being the treasurer for a queen or a king in, in a country as such. You're going to cho choose somebody that is going to be a very integrous type of individual. And his later, his later behavior reinforces the idea that he possessed some good morals, good qualities. Remember that what he had pointed out, what we see in Acts chapter 8, especially when you look around verses 30 and 31 of Acts 8, when he was asked by Philip, do you understand what you're reading? What was his response? How can I, unless someone guides me? We see an integrous nature or character right there. He wants to know what it really says. He's not going to simply jump to conclusions or guess. And he wants to know, what is this all about? This speaks of his own moral integrity. In addition to this, not only do we see that the Ethiopian eunuch was a man of moral integrity, but may we also recognize that he was obviously a man of great religious fervor. Was this a religious man? Well, consider what he's done. Now, we know that he was either a Jew or a proselyte worshiper under the old law as he sat there reading Isaiah 53. He was returning from Jerusalem. He's from Ethiopia. He's returning from Jerusalem, reading Isaiah chapter 53. His study of God's word as he is reading and contemplating God's word extended beyond the official worship period when he was back in Jerusalem worshiping God in the city of the Jews. And we know that, when, again, when we look in the text in Acts 8 and verse 28, he's sitting there and he is reading. He is reading from the scroll of, of Isaiah. Here we see an important official. He was far, far away from home, from a faraway country. And, he, and what has he done? He has taken time off to go to Jerusalem to worship. So I did a little checking on this geographically. The border of Ethiopia, there we have that kind of that northeastern corner, as it were, part of the African continent. The border from Ethiopia to the city of Jerusalem is approximately 1,200 miles. Now, as the crow flies, San Diego to Crescent City in Northern California, as the crow flies, is about 733 miles. Over 800 miles by taking roads. Now I want you to think that this man who is the treasurer to Queen Candace in Ethiopia, and he has traveled by chariot all the way to Jerusalem to worship, does he have some religious fervor? We can see that. Do we ever complain of having to drive 20 or 30 miles sometimes to go to worship in our cars? And as I was thinking about that, if he were to, tra if he were to travel... 12 hours each day, 20 miles an hour in the chariot, it would take him just short of a week to travel that distance. And I want to tell you, 20 miles an hour on those roads, that would be quite a chariot drive. What I'm just simply trying to illustrate is that here is a man of moral integrity. Here is a man of religious fervor. We look at this and we see of how important it was for him to worship God, to please God. Despite the Ethiopians, though, apparent moral and religious uprightness, Philip was directed to him to preach to him because here was an individual that is outside of Christ. Here is an individual that believes in God, wants to worship God, wants to do the right thing, wants to ask the right questions and to get accurate information. And so here is a good heart. And Philip joins himself and preaches the gospel to him. Had not Jesus commissioned the disciples to do exactly that in Mark 16, 15, and 16, to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believes not shall be condemned? We see that. 
Do we not see the multiple examples of people, even as Peter had told those Pentecostian Jews in Acts chapter 2, when they said, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. This man needed the gospel. This man needed the remission of sins. And so Philip the preacher takes him the gospel. If this good man, who is a believer in God, religious fervor, who has this moral uprightness evidently, if he was already saved, why was it necessary for Philip to preach to him and out in the middle of the Gaza desert? It was because he, though he was a man of admirable character, I'll tell you what, he was lost outside of Christ because is that not the condition of humanity when man is outside of Christ? Salvation is only in Christ. And so... He is not even told in this case, will you go back to Ethiopia and look up somebody who will try to tell you what to do. No, we see. We see how important this was and how essential. The conversion of the Ethiopian teaches us that even good people who have not been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins and into the body of Christ are, are lost unless they obey this essential step of salvation. And the middle of the Gaza desert, this takes place. Which brings us to our second point. That the second salient feature about baptism is that not only is it essential, but I would suggest to you it is urgent. Do we see a sense of urgency in the text that we have just read together? In Acts 8 and verse 36, we learn that there is a sense of urgency attached to obeying the gospel. Upon hearing this message of Jesus, the Ethiopian, he understood what he needed to do. And he did not want to be, did you notice the terminology? He did not want to be hindered from doing what Philip preached for him to do. Now all it says is they preached to him Jesus. But they came to that water and he says, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Again, the full content of Philip's teaching is not given. We don't know everything that Philip preached at that setting. But we know that it included baptism, didn't it? Because all it says is he preached to him Jesus. Next verse came on their way to this water, and the eunuch, the Ethiopian, was able to put the two and two together and said, well, here's water. What hinders or stops me from being baptized? What is it that makes baptism so urgent that this man could see the urgency and that people could see the urgency in example after example in the New Testament? When we understand what baptism is and what baptism is really doing, then we can better appreciate the urgency of it. The act of baptism, it is in the act of baptism that yes, while we confess our faith that Jesus Christ is God's Son, that He is the Savior of the world, that He's the only way of salvation, and that is absolutely necessary, a prerequisite to baptism. And yes, while we need to acknowledge our sin and be repentant of those sins, we think of these examples and statements and what is it that a preacher by the name of Ananias said to Saul of Tarsus, and when Saul, the Apostle Paul, talks about his own conversion, he quotes the preacher Ananias verbatim in Acts 22 and verse 16, and Ananias says to Saul of Tarsus, he says, Saul, what are you waiting for? Why tarriest thou, the old King James? What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized, and what? Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What makes baptism so urgent? Because this is the means, the process, through God's plan, by which we are to wash away our sins. You see, it's in baptism that we are buried into Christ. That we understand that obviously water is involved in its burial. In Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul would make this perfectly clear. And when he talked about baptism there. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, he says, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. 
We are buried with Christ in baptism. In baptism, we put on Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. It is a washing away of sins. It is a burial in Christ. It is how we put on Christ, how we are clothed in Christ. The Apostle Paul later would write to the Galatians. In Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. For you are all the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What makes it urgent? What makes baptism so urgent? Our sins are washed away. We are clothed with Christ. We are buried with Him, putting on His death, then His burial, and His resurrection. And no wonder then P Peter states with great clarity in 1 Peter 3.21, he says the light figure we're into baptism does now save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh. When we are immersed or baptized into Christ, we're not getting rid of physical dirt that we are having our sin forgiven, remitted, washed away. Those are urgent needs. You know, other converts in the book of Acts, as I said, there are multiple, multiple cases of conversion. But these other converts that obeyed, who responded to the gospel, they also saw this need, this urgent obedience. How about those obedient Jews in the day of Pentecost? When they were, and they asked, what shall we do? And I quoted Acts 2, 3, 8 a little while ago. There Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, the of sins. Right? But what does it say in verse 41? Those that gladly received the word were baptized. And they're added to them when? That day, about 3,000 souls. Can you imagine? Again, we see the essential nature. We see the urgency. And there are thousands there. Thousands. Can you imagine just the logistics and the orchestration of going on with all the baths and the, the various uh, pools of water that they had throughout the city of people being baptized into Christ that day? It's astounding to me. It's urgent. You know, the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, much some time later, and then Paul preaching to the Philippian jailer in his household, and he asked, good sirs, what must we do to be saved? And he said, if you believe in the Lord Jesus with your, through all your heart and your household, will be saved. But you know what the next verse is going to say? It says, and now there we see that the same hour of the night he was, they were baptized, the same hour of the night being baptized in Acts 16, 31 through 34. And again, Adonai says to Saul, what are you waiting for? That's urgency. Why do you wait? Why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. My friends, what I think we need to understand and share with our friends and neighbors is to know what to do to be saved and still delay is both strange and dangerous rather than simply follow the word of God if one would only examine whatever it is that is keeping him or her from being baptized for the remission of sins into the body of Christ, putting on his death, burial, and resurrection, clothing Christ, if that one would just ask themselves truly, is this really important? Do we see how essential and how urgent that it is? No wonder Paul speaks of in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2 that today... Behold, today is the day of salvation because we must never assume that there's going to be a tomorrow. We have today, which is a reasonable time to do it. Baptism is essential. Baptism is urgent. And then we understand as we look at these accounts, may I suggest thirdly, that baptism is for accountable people. This is evident, again, when we go to our original text in Acts chapter 8. And when we read, you look at verses 27 and 28 of Acts 8. And so Philip arises and beholds a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem to worship, returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Here was a man that could read that could understand, who could mentally process Scripture and, and the importance of, of, of great religious matters. Uh, you look at this text, and that's why after he's being preached to and about Jesus, again his response in verse 36, see here's water. What stops me from being baptized? That's a, that's a man that can understand. 
he recognizes, he perceives, he's able to conceptualize, and he's looking at himself as being what? Accountable to this. Now, so we understand that, first of all, could he understand what he was being taught? Yes. And secondly, having understood the message, was he able and did he have the responsibility to respond on his own? Could Philip force him to do anything with this? No. We're talking about accountable people. And it is therefore we need to be reminded. And it is so curious to me as we see within the larger element of the religious world so much of it that calls itself Christian. But we understand that the New Testament is crystal clear that baptism is for accountable people and that baptism has never been for infants. Don't you find it interesting that there is not a single verse, not a principle or example in the New Testament that gives authority for the practice of infant baptism? There could not be a more anti-biblical practice. And when we understand the prerequisites, what are the prerequisites before one is baptized into Christ that one has to, he that believes and is baptized? Number two, when they said, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. An infant does not have the ability to believe, and if it cannot conceptualize who Jesus Christ is, the Son of God, cannot conceptualize, even understand sin. Furthermore, we do not embrace the doctrine of original sin, but why would that baby need to be baptized in its innocence? That's why there are no examples, no commands, no inferences whatsoever. You see, as presented in the New Testament, every candidate for baptism was a rational, accountable person of an age to understand the significance and meaning of this New Testament teaching. Again, the eunuch is a good example of this. He was of an age and mental capacity to engage in worship. He had just been to Jerusalem. Read the book of Isaiah. Comprehend the teaching of Philip the preacher. Draw a rational conclusion about water baptism. Express belief in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He says, if, Philip says, if you believe, you may. He says, I believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is able to command the chariot to come to a stop, to willingly go into the water and subsequently rejoice. That is a rational, accountable human being. Remember the words of Jesus? Jesus said in John chapter 6 and at verse 45, Jesus said, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. My friends, there has to be hearing and there has to be a learning. And that shows a rational accountability that's at stake. Infants don't have these abilities. I'll tell you, baptism is for accountable people. But, number four, then let us understand that baptism is immersion. Sister Esther Smith gave me three very, very old Bibles here just a few weeks ago. And one of these Bibles is dated and published, and it, it, it's an original. And back in the, uh, about in the 1840s, if memory serves me correctly. But in this Bible publication house, what they were doing within this publication house and I forget what all of its background was. It was kind of a very evangelical denominational background. But trying to give what was the best translation, and this is in the early 1800s, and every case, in fact, the transliterated form of baptism is not used once. It has Jesus saying, he that believes in is immersed. It has Peter saying, then Peter said to them, repent and be immersed, every one of you. It has Ananias telling Saul, what are you waiting for? Arise and be immersed. It has the Apostle Paul saying that the way that we put on Christ is that we are immersed in Christ. And on and on and on. It has Peter saying, 1 Peter 3.21, the like figure wherein to immersion now saves us. They ended up editing it. They, and so I did a little historical research on this translation. It took such, such criticism by some of the denominations that 10 years later they revised it and got rid of immersion and put in the transliteration. And why did they just want baptism? Because the clarity is not there. I'm going to tell you, baptism is not a translation. It's a transliteration. And it's fine. We use it. But what does the word mean? To immerse is to dip, to plunge, to overwhelm. We understand that. Baptism is immersion. 
When the Greek word translated baptism was first found in the Greek language, in fact, it even seldom referred to a bath or washing in the classical Grecian literature. It usually referred to things like sinking ships and they were immersed. It referred to dyeing garments that when they would take garments, clothing, and they would dip them, immerse them in a dye. It referred to all kinds of non-religious types of usage. In, and in fact, even Plato in one of, his, one of his writings, he said, I am baptized, I am immersed in questions. In that very metaphorical sense. Never meant to sprinkle, to dip, in, 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 a, a, a pouring that is, to sprinkle or to pour water upon someone's head. It was a plunging, it was a beneath the surface of type of thing. Couldn't a man of the Ethiopian status have requested or even demanded that some water be brought to him if sprinkling or pouring was sufficient and pleasing to God. But know as they come in their way, he sees a pool of water. And what does it say? What stops me from being baptized? And if you believe it, you, you may. And he made his confession, and they went down to the water. And he was baptized into Christ. My friends, like the Ethiopian, we must obey God in simple faith and be baptized so that we can become his child, his children, and as Christians to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ and we do that because we see it's essential nature, that it's an urgent matter, that it's done by cannibal people, and it is immersion. And then lastly, I'll tell you another salient feature is what it causes, and that's rejoicing. We see it right there in Acts chapter 8. You see, here is the sweet result, if you will, in Acts 8 verse 39. Now when they came up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. But what did the eunuch do? He went on his way rejoicing. I, I pose the question, why would he rejoice? Because here was a man who was outside of Christ, but now he's in Christ. Here was a man who was guilty of sin, but whose sins are now washed away. Here is a man who has now put on or clothed Christ in his life because of baptism. And so we see that he rejoiced. And I just want to suggest to you that this was a very common reaction to those that are obedient to the gospel in the New Testament. The Pentecostian Jews, those 3,000 in verse 47 says, praising God and having favor with all the people of the Lord, added to the church daily, those who are being saved. As people are being added, as they are being saved in the repentance and baptism, a lot of praising God was going on. The Philippian jailer, there again, it talked about he and his household and how they rejoiced. They rejoiced having believed in God with all of his household. And right after his baptism, it was a time of rejoicing. I tell you, Paul reminds us, as we are reminded in Romans, he reminds the Roman Christians in Romans chapter 5 and verse 11. But we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We were separated from God because of sin, but how are we brought back into a right relationship? That's called reconciliation. And how is that made possible? Through the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ. Baptism causes rejoicing. These aren't the only features about baptism. It's not everything that we could say about baptism, hence we don't have just one sermon or two sermons. We're going to have a handful of sermons. But all I want to ask by way of conclusion, even by way of invitation, is this. Have you been baptized the Ethiopian way? I don't mean you have to travel to Gaza and find some little pool of water. But what we see is the precedent that is here, the statements that are made, have you been baptized the Ethiopian way? The Ethiopian way, the Samaritan way, the Pentecostian way, the, the way that Paul did it, it really doesn't make any difference which example that we would emphasize because baptism was consistently preached the same way and practiced the same way throughout the New Testament. So in the words of Ananias to Saul, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized if you have not. And for those that need to do that, we offer you the invitation. To the rest, may we understand this and share this with our friends, our neighbors, the best that we can. But it comes down to this. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And it asks the question, what will your answer be? What will your answer be?
The invitation is extended. Come to the Lord. What will your answer be as we stand, as we sing? So, man,